Welcome to Series 1 of the Latte Lounge podcast. Join me, Katie Taylor, as we talk balancing hormones, busting myths, breaking taboos, boosting libidos and bolstering confidence. Why not grab a coffee, take a seat and join us in the Latte Lounge as we chat all things midlife, menopause and beyond. With thanks to our friends at Silk Natural Lubricant for making this podcast possible. This episode, we're going to be doing some serious myth busting. So many women contact us saying they're suffering with often debilitating menopause symptoms due to a breast cancer diagnosis and have either been told they can't take HRT to manage these symptoms or are too scared to, perhaps because of a lot of fear mongering that's gone on over the last two decades. So who better to discuss this with me than my next guest, Dr. Anis Mukherjee, a menopause specialist and consultant endocrinologist who has been through breast cancer herself. Dr. Mukherjee has a career spanning nearly 30 years. She specializes in general internal medicine and endocrinology with a career long interest in quality of life in all hormone conditions. She's supported thousands of women going through menopause, helping them to manage symptoms and improve their quality of life and overall health safety. Her personal experience of an early menopause due to a breast cancer diagnosis gives her a unique perspective and adds to her insight and skills in this field. She's also the author of The Complete Guide to the Menopause. Renowned for her holistic and personalized approach, her special interests include women's health, menopause, puberty, thyroid disease, calcium and bone disorders, hormone consequences of cancer treatment, and chronic fatigue management. So welcome, Dr. Mukherjee. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. Now, um, I wanted to ask you, there's a lot of um, worried women that contact us. Um, they're still very nervous about um, HRT and breast cancer. And there's been a lot of fear mongering and confusion, um, especially over the last couple of decades. So I was wondering if you could just start by um, sort of maybe clearing up why there has been this sort of fear and where it stems from. Yeah, well, there's there's two aspects, really. There's an aspect of otherwise healthy women developing menopause symptoms and needing symptom relief and using HRT for that. And then there's a separate group of women who have had breast cancer who, who are struggling with menopause symptoms and may want to explore the option of HRT. So they're two separate groups. Now, the, the Women's Health Initiative study published results showing an increased risk of breast cancer with HRT. And the the headlines made everyone terrified. I think the problem was that there's a lot lost in translation with scientific research. And when we use the word increased risk, everyone thinks that means they're definitely gonna get breast cancer. Whereas increased risk depends on what your background risk is. And if your background risk is very low, then, it's increasing a risk from very low to slightly less than very low, you know, so relative risk and increased risk, it's how you interpret it. And I think essentially what the results showed was that there was a small increase in certain groups after a certain length of time. And when we looked at the bigger picture and looked at, at who was having problems, it was more predictable to see why. And the vast majority of otherwise healthy women can take HRT for, for, for several years without any increased risk. And there are small increased risks with very long duration of treatment. We don't know why. It doesn't appear that HRT causes breast cancer. It looks like it may be a subgroup of people who have possibly an, something indolent there already. And after many years, that can trigger a diagnosis we don't know if those women were going to get breast cancer anyway whether it brings the diagnosis forward there's still a lot that we don't fully understand but essentially you know it's we always recommend that it's good to have a discussion with your doctor about any particular risks you might have as as an individual because I think now it is well established that other environmental factors can increase your risk of breast cancer. We know that, you know, somewhere between one in seven and one in nine women will get breast cancer in their lifetime. And things like drinking alcohol beyond target limits, being overweight, particularly postmenopausally, smoking, lack of physical 
exercise all increase your risk so if you've got a full house of risk factors you need to just be aware that you may be adding to that if you've no risk factors and you're going to gain huge benefit from the quality of life then it's kind of a no-brainer but just have have your risks and benefits reviewed so essentially we've come full circle 20 odd years later and we see that you know most and there's also different types of hrt um estrogen only hrt doesn't really appear to be associated with any additional risk estrogen progesterone combined hrt particularly the continuous combined seems to have a slightly higher risk but this is after several years in certain people so it's not that everybody's at risk it's just that you need to have your risk explained to you by a healthcare professional and then there's more controversy still really with the group of women who've had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer in particular who um, we know estrogen drives that that cancer so if there are any cancer cells there estrogen can potentially cause that to to progress so it could result in increased risk of secondary breast cancer and there have been a number of studies there have been you know really well conducted randomized controlled trials there have been observational studies and there are some of the observational studies don't suggest an increased rate of cancer recurrence. They don't suggest an increased rate of breast cancer deaths. Observational studies are, um, are tricky because they aren't necessarily really, um, you know, they don't standardise for all different other factors that can contribute to your outcome. So for an observational study, you often need, especially with breast cancer, can take a long time to come back in anyone um as a secondary form it can take decades to see if if in observational studies to see if, if treatment is is increasing risk again estrogen only treatment seems to not have as much of effect as combined but you know there was a study called the liberate study which a lot of people a lot of even doctors don't acknowledge it was looking at um patients treated with a a hormone treatment called tibolone which is which is a hormone replacement therapy which actually is associated with reduced breast cancer risk in most women who take HRT as a pri you know primary treatment um, it, it's 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 got a much lower rate it's equivalent to estrogen only HRT and that uh, was there was a, a, a trial called the liberate study that looked at tibolone in women who'd had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer and it did increase very significantly risk of recurrence which is different from women who've never had breast cancer. It was completely different. So, I mean, I, I would say we'd never say never in a woman who's struggling, but in women who've had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer already, that's a much more serious and it should be a much more, you know, thought about decision about whether to use HRT. In terms of otherwise healthy fit women who've got symptoms, who want help, the decision is pretty easy as far as I'm concerned. The decision is really about which preparation you want to use. Yeah. And, and I want to go into a bit more detail about that. But for those who may not know uh, much about you, can you maybe tell us a little bit about your own personal story? Because obviously it's very you know relevant to what we're talking about now. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I started out my medical career after graduating from medical school in 1992 and I went one of my first jobs was actually in a cancer hospital and I worked on a breast cancer ward so that was my first exposure to to clinical me hospital medicine so I, and that was in the early 1990s when women didn't young women with premenopausal breast cancer they just hardly survived they didn't survive breast cancer more than a couple of years and that was a time when a pioneering new drug called tamoxifen, I know you know about that, um, was being trialled and that was proven to be phenomenally successful in reducing breast cancer recurrence. And then chemotherapy regimens improved and then aromatase inhibitors um, subsequently became available for postmenopausal breast cancer. And so we've gone from a, a disease that was um, pretty much incurable for, for many women, for most women, to a disease which most women survive. So I um, then specialized in endocrinology and I looked after many women who'd had breast cancer who had difficult menopause symptoms um, because I was you know, specializing in endocrinology, uh, ha have an interest in quality of life and women's health. And I worked in cancer hospitals 
over the years again in fact I went back to the same hospital that I first worked in and did research in cancer survivors and helped them with quality of life and hormone consequences of their cancer treatments and then and I think this is what you were asking me about in 2011 having all this specialist experience I developed estrogen receptor positive breast cancer myself and so the one thing that's different for me compared to most women who either go through menopause or get breast cancer is that I had huge dollops of knowledge and insight about this. I knew everything that was going on. Of course, I'd never been through a cancer diagnosis. So that bit for me was obviously just as challenging as anyone else. I had young children, um, you know, I had a career that was, you know, doing great, everything was good. And suddenly this, was, I was got smashed in the face with a cancer diagnosis. And I had two cancers and I, so it was difficult to quantify my overall risk of recurrence because multifocal disease can be tricky to assess in terms of what treatments. And in the end, they said, look, because these cancers are both low grade, that you don't need chemotherapy. So I then, having all the experience that I had and the knowledge and seen all the results of the studies, and I've done a lot of clinical research, so I understand how some research can be flawed, how you interpret results being cautious about looking at one study and thinking oh if that study is fine then you know x equals you know y plus z or something like that you can get you can get incorrect conclusions from isolated research studies and I always look at a broad set of studies and I knew that for me because I you know I, I wanted to survive I didn't want this cancer to come back early stage breast cancer tends to come back five or ten or fifteen years later so you might think you're doing all the right things in the first couple of years, but it's later on. And I just didn't want any estrogen around that could possibly feed any cancer in my body. You know, and I'll, I'll probably never know because, you know, you can get you can get recurrence at 20 years or 25 years. Um, so but at that time, I didn't want estrogen to be around to feed any lazy cancer cells that were just going to sit there for years, because if you don't feed them, if you block their food supply which is estrogen they just fizzle up and and die and that's partly how tamoxifen works so I did take tamoxifen but I knew that I was a young woman I was premenopausal. I had lots of estrogen so I didn't get off a chemotherapy I had uh, chemical menopause treatment which just blocked all my hormones overnight and so the difference for me with the menopause was that I knew exactly what I was dealing with and you'll know Katie, that from, from all the celebrities that talk about menopause is they say they had all these symptoms and they didn't know what they were and they didn't know what to do. Well, from day one, because part, part of, I mean, the, the whole point was that it was, it was deliberate. I knew what was going to happen. So it was, it was almost a planned menopause and I knew what was happening and I knew how to deal with it because I'd helped many, many women. I'd helped women with HRT, but I'd also help women who couldn't take HRT, had side effects with it. You know, it was not safe for them. And I've, I've helped many women over many years with a range of strategies to help overcome menopausal symptoms, as well as making sure you're paying attention to optimizing your long term health. So that's what I did for myself. And that, you know, for me, menopause wasn't difficult. And I, I'm not I mean, I may well be lucky and I'm not judging anyone because I've seen women who've done everything right and had terrible menopause. I've seen women who do everything wrong and don't have symptoms and we're all different. And that's why no one should judge. But I know for a fact because I was going through a cancer diagnosis at the same time, remember, so it wasn't a walk in the park, but I knew what was happening and I knew what to do. And it made my menopause experience easier. And of course, Many of us need help and support with menopause symptoms, but if you know what you're dealing with, it is not as hard. And that was what led me to write my book, because there's lots and lots of little things that we can all do that can smooth out the ride, smooth the roller coaster into a merry-go-round. And, you know, then with any additional treatments, those additional treatments will work better. So, you know, that that is my story, basically. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, look, um, I mean, knowledge is power, as they say, and I think everything that all of us sort of menopause campaigners do, you know, and all you amazing doctors do is is, is just making women and, and their doctors and healthcare professionals aware of, of the symptoms and aware of risks and how to have these conversations with your healthcare providers. Because, you know, I know as a, obviously as a doctor's daughter, you know, and he obviously was a, is a breast cancer professor, but obviously now retired that I've kind of 
I've grown up with that whole conversation around my dinner table and these complicated cases. And I hear all the time from women, especially the ones who are on tamoxifen, who just feel you know, like they've just drawn the short straw. And, you know, obviously it's very brave of you to sort of share your story and it's absolutely inspiring. But, you know, um, one thing we hear a lot about is, is um, so sort of women with estrogen positive breast cancer, they suffer, you know, like a lot of us with things like vaginal dryness, and vaginal atrophy. And again, they're very scared of of vaginal estrogen, because, you know, a lot, a lot of people say, you know, use lubricants and, and vaginal estrogen. And um, I'm assuming that's a much sort of safer option, is it not? Because it's um, obviously not absorbed in the bloodstream, I'm assuming. Yes, yes, absolutely. So it's it's the systemic HRT that we, this, and especially the combined estrogen progesterone, and possibly estrogen only, but it's just still relatively unclear. There are different schools of thought, but it's the systemic, which goes through your whole body that is more concerning because if there's any cancer cells, they can pick up on, on that, you know, being fed by the estrogen. With vaginal symptoms, vaginal symptoms are quite a big symptom and they can be a big symptom with tamoxifen. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It never goes, it never goes. It's fine. It doesn't even, it's, it's, Sorry, you're fine. So we'll we'll start that bit again. I apologise. If you know, this is really annoying because that'll be some cold caller, and I only have that phone for out. <laughs> it's fine. So right. we'll we'll breathe and start again. Yeah. Um, but you were saying vaginal um, uh, so, dryness atrophy is serious symptom. Yeah. So be. so vaginal symptoms can be a real problem for women on tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors. In fact, tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor blocker. So it actually stimulates estrogen in the vagina. So many women who take tamoxifen actually find that they have their lubrication of their vagina is fine while they're on tamoxifen. But it's absolutely true that some women don't get that effect and they get really bad dryness. And it's a bit like with hot flushes. Some women get terrible hot flushes with menopause and some women don't get hot flushes at all. We're all different. It's it's receptors, it's genes, it's it's all sorts of things. Um, so um, some women get dryness with tamoxifen. Most women get really bad dryness with aromatase inhibitors, the aromadex and, and those types of medications, the postmenopausal um, breast cancer, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And so we, we tend to say, look, try vaginal uh, moisturizers and lubricants. And they do give some relief, but if you're getting recurrent water infections or if those treatments aren't giving you relief, then we, we wouldn't just give it for no reason if you didn't have symptoms, but with symptoms, then we do recommend estrogen vaginally. And it does, in the limited data we've got, appear to be extremely safe. So I wouldn't hold back. You know, if it's affecting your quality of life, there are, you know, that treatment appears to be safe. So vaginal estrogen should be considered as definitely an option um, in anyone who's struggling with those symptoms or, you know, having those symptoms. So and yeah. equally in women who are on HRT, because actually systemic HRT doesn't always resolve the vaginal symptoms. And many women need vaginal estrogen in addition. Um, and it just it's getting to where it's needed and, and it's very effective for many women. Absolutely. So look, what, how and when should women sort of make these individual decisions about their own personal risk, risk factor? And, 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 you know, you've mentioned what what is relative risk. So you know so if if you've got a woman who's coming to see you how do you actually sort of sit down with them and make that decision is it is it with um a, a gp a menopause specialist is it with an oncologist as well how, how does it work that conversation so do you mean in women who've had breast cancer or just, well and... yeah well women who've had breast cancer in particular but but also um other women we have discussed that a little bit on our previous podcast but it would be good to have that kind of you know clarity yeah, so I mean, it's it's different. The, the, the amount of discussion um, and the specialism of the specialist you're speaking to is 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 going to be different depending on which scenario. So the first thing is knowing what you're dealing with, and I think the current media exposure that's getting out there to all women about menopause, about what the symptoms might be, is really good because it's making women in their forties, in particular be aware that if they've got any symptoms, it could be menopause, because it's much better to recognize the symptoms and seek help early when the symptoms are perhaps not severe, but you know that there's something progressing, rather than wait till you are in a heap on the floor feeling dreadful and desperate 
Because with any medical condition, if you leave it late to get a diagnosis, it's harder to get back on track. So earlier recognition, and that's with education of women, which is really important. Then the first port of call for all women should be their GP. Um, in an otherwise healthy woman, the decision to give HRT if you are having, if you've noticed progressive symptoms that are bothering you, then it doesn't require a specialist. The GPs should, you know, they should be able to do and they can prescribe HRT. They are clearly prescribing it more at the moment because that's why we've had HRT shortages. Um, but for an otherwise healthy woman, it's relatively straightforward. If after an initial discussion with a GP, there are any concerns, so perhaps a woman who's got a full house of risk factors or who's had, you know, a history of issues with their breasts, for example, if they've got dense breasts, if they've had concerning mammograms or anything in the, in the past, or if they've got, even if they've got a strong family history, the GP may start them on treatment, but refer them on to a specialist just to make sure that there's closer monitoring. That would be reasonable. And in women who've had a diagnosis of breast cancer, what I would really like to see is better integrated menopause care in the specialist service for those women. And that is not routine at the moment. There's very minimal advice for women in the breast cancer services for, you know, even recognizing, acknowledging menopause symptoms and giving advice. And there is a, there is a gap there. That is a problem. And GPs often don't really know what to do. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be a flippant decision for the reasons I told you. It needs to be a decision where if a woman maybe has higher risk of getting a recurrent breast cancer, different options can be discussed for managing symptoms. And what treatments are used depend on what the symptoms are. So for example, if the symptoms are mainly vaginal symptoms, then vaginal estrogen can be offered, um, as well as you know, topical um, lubricants and moisturizers. Um, if hot sweats or flushes or sleep problems are the main symptom, there are other non-hormone treatments that could be tried in women who are at high risk of breast cancer recurrence. So it should be, um, you know, a, a very balanced and careful decision to discussing the different options, explaining risks to women, not just that, well, all the studies that suggested breast cancer recurrence might be flawed. So therefore, well, let's just give it and let's just not worry about it. Because that woman might go on HRT thinking it's safe, but actually her recurrence might come in seven or 10 years. And that's a long time away. And then it's all forgotten. But then on the other hand, some women may not be at higher risk of recurrence. So that should really be a discussion with the breast cancer multidisciplinary team. So every cancer network, so with the breast cancer teams, there is what we call a multidisciplinary team that meets regularly. So if a woman who's had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is having symptoms, she should have support for symptom management. If that doesn't work, the decision about HRT should be between that woman and her specialist, but the specialist should discuss the case at the regional MDT. So lots of specialists involved can advise about different options to, so that she goes through the safest possible treatment path that's going to reduce that cancer coming back. And, you know, if a woman says, I don't care, I don't care if I'm a high risk of it coming back. I know that you're telling me that I, I've got a very high risk of cancer recurrence, but I want to take HRT. That is her decision, but it must be an informed decision. She mustn't just think it's okay because it's okay for people who haven't had breast cancer because it's a different risk stratification. So it's, um, Obviously, there are other things that we can all do, and you touched on it before in terms of reducing the risk and just in, in general, sort of staying healthy and fit and well. Um, so, you know, what did you use to manage any sort of symptoms you may have had yourself? And what would you advise to women that they can do to help themselves, for the, especially for this group that can't or, or don't want to take HRT, perhaps because of this breast cancer in the family yeah. or history. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I use what I call my toolkit, which is which I, I describe in my book. But um, to be honest, I've learned that toolkit over the last two or three decades by by hook or by crook, partly and also studying clinical medicine in general. And it's not just for people who can't take HRT. It's actually I see many women who are on HRT. And in fact, day in, day out, I have patients like this 
they're on HRT, they've tried uh, several different types and they're not feeling well. And this toolkit will help those women feel well just as much as it'll help women who are not taking HRT, can't take it, haven't tolerated it, it's not safe for. The toolkit works for everybody. And actually in my career, I probably spent more time trying to improve the quality of life of women who are already on HRT that I have, although I am a, I am a specialist in late effects, I, I have seen many women who've had breast cancer helping them to navigate their menopause without HRT. For many of my patients, I use this toolkit for patients who are on HRT and just not feeling good, you know, because HRT is not a panacea for everything in life. And lots of other things are going on in your life when you're a midlife woman. So my talk and, you know, long term health is not just about HRT. I mean, again, you might think so because the media says it's great, but it is good for many women, but it's not a panacea for long term health. So my toolkit to keep it brief, number one, movement. Movement is so important on a daily basis. Doing a, a gym class twice a week and sitting down at a desk or in front of the TV or at your kitchen table for the rest of the week without any movement is not physiological movement. Your bones, your joints, your muscles, your ligaments will all seize up. Whether or not you're on HRT, you'll ache. Um, you'll probably have a more flat metabolism because you're not moving, so you'll gain weight easier. You know, and weight gain has its own issues. It, weight gain increases the risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, lots of other health issues, several cancers if you become obese. So um, exercise is number one, movement. And, you know, exercise, as I said in, in the documentary recently, women hate the word exercise, especially if then they haven't done exercise for 20 years and they're going, are you kidding me? I've not done exercise for 20 years. Any movement, 10 minutes walking instead of 10 minutes on social media. Brilliant. If you do that every day, you've already improved your your long term health risks and you will improve your symptoms, maybe not overnight, but within a few weeks, you'll start to crave doing it because it's, it's enjoyable. Fresh air preferably and preferably if you're walking outside when you're starting your exercise no devices you don't you know you're not on a podcast you're just getting the sort of the environment and it's a sort of a mindfulness pursuit walking and if you want to build up from that build up slowly so that's the movement side nutrition is important um nutrition is about adding healthy stuff so that you don't crave the bad stuff as much the bad stuff in our diets is there. It's it's just everywhere. So ultra processed foods is in all of our houses, in all of our cupboards. And the only way to, to phase that out is by introducing healthier things, adding those healthier things in high fiber, natural foods and building those up and then hopefully craving the bad things less. And if you're carrying excess weight, weight management is helpful, obviously, but if you're exhausted and aching, you need to address your quality of life before you'll be able to do calorie deficits to lose weight. Weight loss is not easy for anybody, particularly not a midlife woman, you know, who's going through menopause. So, you know, nutrition is important. Um, managing fatigue is linked with sleep very much as well. So in terms of menopause, hot sweats, flushes, waking with a racing heart, palpitations, wide awake is a is a is a midlife um, uh, menopause symptom but a lot of us have sleep fragmentation because of modern world sleep factors like too much screen time the blue light on our devices is stimulating it reduces your and delays your melatonin release so that in in turn you know delays your onset of quality sleep at night so if you're on a device late at night that's bad too much caffeine, too much, you know, stressful content on the devices. It's not just the blue light. It's looking at really stressful things on social media or on the news that will make you feel stressed. It will put your cortisol levels up. Your cortisol levels should be really low at night. That's why we sleep. And if you go to bed wired with high cortisol and blue light pumping through your system and low melatonin, you're not going to sleep well, right? And then, then if you're tired, napping in the day will often disrupt your sleep sort of routine as well, your, your body clock for sleep. So sleep, fatigue, body clocks are all very much interlinked. And those things, it's not a quick fix. 
for if, if you've got into bad habits, you can get away with those bad habits a lot of your adult life. Most of us don't just go into menopause with a with a perfect life and suddenly everything falls apart. Usually we've all sort of maybe not focused on very healthy eating or regular exercise or good sleep patterns, you know, often had too much stress. Of course, we've all got too much stress in our lives that, that overflows with all of our individual roles in different aspects of our lives. So so managing stress is also very important and managing stress links in with all the things I've just talked about, because if you're stressed, you crave sugar. So that's bad. So, if you, But if you do exercise, you, you can dissipate some of the stress, daylight, walking outside, better sleep quality. And stress is very linked with self-care or lack of it, which, again, midlife women tend to have and I think this is not a sweeping statement I think it's fairly representative unrelenting standards they put themselves last they everybody else is first they want to look after elderly relatives have voluntary roles work look after their kids you know look after their siblings or whatever it is doing a lot for everyone and what I say is self-care is not being selfish because if you look after yourself you're going to be better for those around you and if you're stressed and irritable and exhausted it's only a matter of time before you won't be able to look after those people around you so actually self-care is phenomenally important and phenomenally neglected in midlife women and you know these things I've spent years telling my patients about these things so when I knew that I was going to go into menopause by my chemical treatment I knew what, how important these things are and I knew I wouldn't probably feel better overnight but it would be a work in progress and I wasn't doing a lot of exercise when when I got diagnosed with breast cancer because I, I had I was working full-time writing up an MD had two young kids we just renovated the house had a lot going on it was all okay but I, I didn't have any time for self-care and I knew that had to change and it did change and I'm so glad and I think I'm better for those around me the, 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 the final thing, and there's lots of things I could go on forever, as you can probably tell. But the other thing that's really important, and it's important for all of us for our future health and our future well-being and quality of life, is a social network. And it is hugely important. And that's not just social media. I mean, friendships, you know, time, time to just talk about things with friends, um, be able to enjoy quality time. That That is a good stress reliever and downtime. And I think, especially in the pandemic, a lot of people were very socially isolated. I think pretty much most people felt quite socially isolated. And that, that can go away now because we're coming out of, of that terrible sort of phase of, of not being able to see people. But being able to see people and connect with friends is really important for well-being, self-care, stress relief, et cetera. Well, I mean, that's a fantastic toolkit and I wouldn't want anyone to feel um, overwhelmed. I mean, I'm actually testament to that, that for four years when I had all my awful symptoms and I had to leave my job and I was just this shell of a woman, for me, the missing piece was HRT. But even then, although I felt better emotionally and mentally, I had put on a lot of weight, as you said. And so I just start once I felt connected with the world again and had that sort of joy back in my life. Um, I then sort of put into place just very small, manageable yeah. habits. So just a workout video, which I actually started in lockdown, just in, in the morning by my bed. So it wasn't like, oh, my God, I've got to get out and go to a gym, you know, and, and just like tweaking my diet. And, and, and I've noticed and it's a new thing for me. You know, I think we grew up in the 80s where everyone was yo-yo dieting and rushing off to aerobics. But actually just by doing small, manageable habits that become, you know, habitual day every single day or, or a few days a week it, it you notice that your health and well-being you know do improve and and that was the whole point everything you've said was the whole point of the Lassie Lounge I wanted to shine a spotlight on the woman in the middle who is being pulled from every single direction and to feel we can have these chats you know yes this is a virtual coffee shop but obviously we, we do have in-person meetups and I think your last point it, which very few people touch on the ability to laugh you know with a girlfriend is, is the best thing in the world because we're all relating to it and we're all going through the same stuff so look we, we've only got a few minutes left and I wanted to ask you two small final things um are you aware of any new sort of research treatment options that are in the pipeline that, that will hopefully help women with, with breast cancer or a history of it, you know, especially those with an estrogen positive breast cancer? 
Yeah, so there are non-hormone treatments available now, but they're different for different people. But there is a new treatment in the pipeline, um, which works on the, the temperature regulation center in the hypothalamus in the brain. And it's a neurotransmitter sort of mechanism that's being targeted. And that the, the drug is, is actually being studied now very close to license in otherwise fit and healthy women going through the menopause. So initially, when it gets its license, it's not going to be available for women with breast cancer. But I know that those studies in women with breast cancer are going to be starting very soon. A lot of people are asking me about that. Um, the, 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 the formulation that's probably going to be first to market is a drug called Fezolinotant, which is being made by a pharmaceutical company, company uh, which is Japanese. I think it's called Astellas Pharma. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a treatment which has been proven to reduce hot flushes and sweats and night sweats very significantly, very significantly quicker than HRT works on hot sweats and nights. Uh, flushes and night sweats so it's obviously targeting that very mechanism and it seems to help with um, sleep quality um, fatigue and even some of the results suggest it, it helps with weight management as well so it's helping quite a lot of symptoms which are very significant menopausal symptoms um, People have asked me, does it help with bone health? You know, because obviously HRT is very good for bones. We don't know that yet. And probably it won't because it doesn't work through estrogen. Um, but there are other ways of protecting your bones through lifestyle, movement, you know, calcium, vitamin D, various different things. Um, but this new treatment definitely has the potential to be a really good additional treatment for women who haven't done well with HRT, who can't take it, who perhaps have had a cancer which could potentially be, you know, make HRT more risky. Um, so, you know, that is exciting for the future, really exciting. Well, that's good news for everyone. Now, listen, um, before we go, tell everyone about your book, um, sort of what's it, obviously, what's it called? Why did you write it? And where can people obviously buy it and find out more about you? Well, well I wrote it because I do think that menopause is, you know, a, a phase of life, we've got a lot of life in us after menopause, and we want to keep that as healthy as we can. And we want to optimize, you know, quality of life symptoms, well being, health. And, you know, I do write about HRT in my book as well. I'm not just, you know, I spend a lot of my life prescribing HRT because it is so helpful for so many women. Um, but I do, I know that on its own, HRT will not suddenly make you you know, lose weight, for example, you know, if you've gained a lot of weight over time, it's not a substitute for exercise, it's not a substitute for a social network, you know, all so, and it, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to suddenly make you feel less stressed if you're stressed. So, but it, it helps with menopause symptoms. And sometimes it helps you get back on that track. And you also touched on employment, which is a huge issue, because I think if we had better support in employment, a lot of women would suffer less. You know, you talked about that's a really pertinent issue. So my book I wrote because I wanted women to have a toolkit, you know, and they can, but it needs to be tailored to their individual needs. All of our symptoms are different. All of our circumstances are different. You know, our background health is different. We have different genes. You know, so my book, the idea of it is to help a woman with her menopause symptoms, regardless of what her symptoms are, you know, to help her make sure that she can get through menopause as seamlessly as possible and maintain optimal health. I talk in, in the chapter on HRT about when you should consider adding it in, for example, because a lot of women go, well, how do I know when to start? You know, do I start when I'm 20? <laughs> do I start when I'm 30 before I get symptoms? So I talk about what, you know, when to consider it. Um, but then I also talk about all of these other things that I've talked to you about in terms of a toolkit to help you feel better for the long haul. So the book's called The Complete Guide to the Menopause. I've got a, I've got a copy here, but I don't think we're going to be videoing it. But there you go. That's um, a copy of it. It's very bright colours and um, it's available through all the online bookstores. Oh, lovely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee. That's going to help so many people, I'm sure of it. Um, and where, if people would like to obviously see you, um, where, where is your clinic and website? Where can people find out more? So my website is called hormonewise.co.uk, as in get wise to hormones, um, and because I also look after patients with thyroid disease and younger women with different hormone related issues. Um, 
as, as uh, you know any any hormone related issues I deal with really um and all the details of my clinics are on my website okay lovely well we'll put all of that in our show notes anyway so thank you so much again that's been really really helpful and very interesting my pleasure If you've enjoyed this podcast and would like extra support with managing your menopause symptoms, then why not consider becoming a Latte Lounge member? Members get access to members-only masterclasses with medical specialists and wellbeing experts, members-only content, how-to guide and resources, plus a chance to connect with other women just like you in a warm, friendly, private community. Podcast listeners get to join for just £10 for the first month. See show notes for more details. Thanks for listening to the Latte Lounge podcast. Please subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss our next episode. For more support with all things menopause and midlife, head to our website, lattelounge.co.uk and search for the Latte Lounge group on Facebook. This podcast was sponsored by Silk Natural Lubricant and produced by Emily Crosby Media.